Hello, good morning and good afternoon for uh, people in, uh, in Europe. Uh, this is uh, Walter Chalier. I'm the chief librarian of uh, UN ECLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, welcome everyone to the webinar, the Learn Toolkit, an armory of best practice for all research performing organizations. First of all, some practical information. So the people in the audience uh, are muted, but please use your chat box to submit questions. And there will be a Q&A session after the webinar. The webinar is being recorded, and we will distribute a link to the recording shortly after it ends. Is your institution working on a research data management policy? Is your institution looking for examples of best practice when it comes to managing research data? The Learn Toolkit was recently launched by the EU-funded Learn Project as a resource for anyone looking at how best to manage research data. It takes the issues identified in the LERU roadmap and provides templates, case studies, and a model RDM policy, all aimed at helping institutions to successfully create, implement, and execute their own RDM plans. During this one hour webinar, members of LEARN will discuss the project in general and the resources contained within the toolkit. The webinar will feature the following speakers. We will start with Martin Moyle, Assistant Director Support Services at UCL Library Services. He oversees the day-to-day -day work of library services and collections, digital libraries, records management, open access, publishing, and academic liaison, including support for research data management. He has managed a number of multi-partner open access and technical projects in the UK, including several funded by the UK JISC, and has managed work packages for the EU-funded Europeana Travel, Europeana Libraries, and Europeana Cloud projects. After Martin, we will listen to Paolo Bodroni, who's the head of department at Vienna University Library. He is the head of, uh, he's also project leader, leader of e-infrastructure Austria, implemented the institutional repository at University of Vienna, has a long-term involvement in digital assets management and the provision of aligned services in the scientific community that provided him with a thorough knowledge of technical systems and the requirements of the academic world. He's been involved in several EU projects such as Europeana, Open Air and Open Air Plus. He uh, is uh, focusing in the LEARN project on stakeholder engagement, policy development and alignment, impact and advocacy. So I give the floor now to uh, Martin Moyle, who will give the first presentation. Hi, thanks, Wouter. Here we, oh, thank you. Right, here we go, learn. <clears throat> So, as Wouter has um, outlined, we're here for the LEARN project, uh, a two-year project, and the fundamental point of LEARN is to provide practical assistance to research form performing institutions in uh, managing research data. It's a multi-partner project. Um, we're not all Europeans. Uh, we have a partnership with Latin America as well, um, as you've heard from Wouter. And as you can see, we've been going for nearly two years, and in fact, we've nearly finished. And um, this uh, webinar is uh, uh, one of the first um, times that we've been able to disseminate some of our major uh, deliverables. We um, founded LEARN on the back of something called the LERU Roadmap for Research Data which was published a couple of years ago. LERU is the League of European Research Universities. So this roadmap, which came out in um, 2014, 
looked at the challenges of research data management for research institutions across uh, a number of areas, um, some of which you see here. Who's going to lead on research data management uh, for European research universities? Where's the investment going to come from? Where are the policies going to come from? What are the key messages? Uh, how do you advocate for research data management? How are you going to get a university to invest in it? There are lots of curation issues, selection, retention, ownership, licensing, and um, infrastructural issues as well, systems, but also staffing and skills. A lot of those issues, of course, are familiar challenges for libraries, uh, but of course here they're in a new setting. How much is it going to cost? Well, there's no easy answer to that, but um, it, you, you, of course, will need an answer if you're going to get senior management buy-in to research data management. And who, in fact, is going to be responsible for what? There are many stakeholders uh, in RDM, uh, particularly in universities. You've got university managers, libraries, IT departments, researchers themselves, and PIs, funders. So the Lero report uh, brought all this together um, with a number of case studies and recommendations. Uh, it's a very good read in its own right. The URL is there at the bottom of the slide. But the overall findings, I think, you might summarize as, uh, as, as four headlines. Um, firstly, it did become very clear that Levels of readiness. Right, I'm sorry if there are problems with my microphone. Um, due to various unfortunate circumstances, I'm in a bit of a Heath Robinson arrangement, so I will try and hold it steady. But I, um, if, if, if the sound is um, creating issues for you, then do let the organizer know, and I'll, I'll do my best. So, um, Larry Roadmap, OK. Um, research data readiness probably not where it should be. There have been amazing advances in computer processing and storage in recent years. It has been said that 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. Of course, that's not all research data. But even the pace of creation of research data is fairly striking. Uh, the human genome took something like 10 years to sequence uh, in, in, the, in the 1990s. Now, DNA, sorry, DNA sequence data doubles uh, every six months. Uh, the, the, there is an absolutely phenomenal amount of data creation going on, and yet uh, other studies have shown that some 80% of it is lost for reuse. So universities and research performing organizations uh, really need to embrace the challenges of managing research data. And to do this, they themselves need policies and strategies for how they're going to deal with it. Researchers need to get into the habit of research data management planning. And the benefits of open data, which I'll come back to, should be advocated. So those were the main findings uh, at very headline level from the Larry Roadmap in 2014. And that's where LEARN comes in, because the job of the project was to take forward the recommendations from the Larry Roadmap and uh, help to embed good practice in research data management. So we have a small number of main deliverables there. We've got uh, a model research data management policy, which my colleague Paolo is going to talk about in a few minutes. We have a toolkit to help the implementation of research data management. And we've produced some executive briefings. And in fact, the toolkit encompasses all those uh, items. So it's a bit of a one-stop shop. And by the way, the link to the Learn Toolkit you will find in the right-hand corner of the screen at the bottom. So Learn, we've been very busy. Uh, we've nearly finished. We've particularly used uh, a workshop approach to developing what we've done, stakeholder workshops with funders, repository managers, researchers, librarians, publishers, all present and participating in discussion and breakout and so on. And uh, much of what's in the Learn Toolkit has emerged from these interactions. The main body of the toolkit is a series of case studies. We have 23 best practice case studies split across the eight sections that you can see there. Um, 
What I'm going to do next is just give you a brief flavour by looking at three or four of them, ones that I found particularly interesting, but do by, uh, well, do of course read the Learn Toolkit at your leisure. Most of these case studies are about four pages and most of them are to the point. And as you can see, it covers a wide range of areas. One that I was particularly struck by, and I was also very pleased by it because it emerged from discussions that we'd had during the Learn workshops, was a toolkit kindly provided for us by members of Goldsmiths University about research data management in the performing arts. Goldsmiths is a UK institution that's very strong in creativity and interdisciplinarity and the performing arts. Um, they've been grappling with non-traditional research outputs for some years and they also face challenges in research data management too. And some of those are captured in the case study in the Learn Toolkit. The authors are describing here a project, um, a, a, an artistic project. They, um, it's, it's essentially a traveling sound installation that they put into four forests in the United Kingdom. So they spent some time going to these forests and researching all the animals and uh, um, flora in the forests. They assigned each of these species musical themes and motifs. And then for the actual installation, they played live music in the forests, depending on the anticipated movements and interactions of all these organisms that they'd researched. So Living Symphonies was the, the name of the, um, of the research project, I believe. In terms of data, they did a whole year of research doing ecological surveys in these forests, taking photographs. Um, there are some 3D software simulations. There are recordings. There are illustrations. And then for the actual installations themselves, they've also got lots of what you might call live data. They've got the audio, the video, uh, photographic records. They've got records of audience engagement with the performing arts project. Uh, they've got the press coverage. There's uh, uh, the, 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 the depth and, and range of uh, research data that underpins a project like this is quite nice or eye opening. So, this case study, well, it's not exactly best practice in the sense that research data here has been sustainably curated and uh, shareable because uh, it's mainly on hard drives with some cloud backup. But it's a very good document of a range of formats, uh, sizes, capture methods, and uh, general planning techniques. And it's also a really interesting lesson in what to think about, or what you might need to think about in terms of uh, performing arts projects. If you're working with researchers in areas like this, it would be very helpful input into data management planning. So that was one of the um, case studies that I thought was very interesting. The, the next one I'm going to just briefly talk about is uh, we're back to open data. You'll be aware there's a growing consensus that data should be fair, should be findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. There are very good reasons for that. Um, reusing data means you don't have to pay to duplicate it. Uh, it helps with transparency and credibility of research because research can be reproduced. It particularly helps machine action of research, so computers using data to synthesize new research findings and discoveries. And also, generally, uh, it's been shown that putting the data out there speeds up the progress of science, particularly in those grand interdisciplinary challenges. Now, not all data can be made open. There are considerations like personal confidentiality, uh, national security, commercial interests. Having said that, not enough is being made open. Uh, there isn't enough open data out there. So Professor Bolton states the case very eloquently, in fact, both for open data and for universities championing open data and research as an inherently open enterprise. The image that I've put on the screen illustrates some of the challenges. The open data iceberg. The graphic there is essentially telling us that technology, 
with appropriate permissions and licenses is the easy part. Uh, the challenges, to a large extent, are cultural. So at the very bottom of the iceberg there, we've got acceptance by researchers, the mindset. Then do they have incentives to make their data open? Will they see the benefits? Does the sector have the skills to exploit the open data once it's been made open? And then how do we support research data management, good practice in research data management? Are funders on board? How do local practices fit with national and international infrastructures in a standard way? So his case study actually ends with a vision of a semantic web for science. Uh, lots of work to be done there, especially around standards. One more I thought uh, I would like to highlight briefly is a case study that was very kindly provided for us by the University of Edinburgh. Um, looking at the origins of their RDM work, which uh, as far as I can see go back to at least 2008. This is a very good practical case study. There is lots of hard detail here about timescales, policy development, all the services that they provide, uh, data planning and data management plan support, storage, curation, post-project, and generally research data management support across those, uh, uh, those phases of the, the research life cycle. There's detail about the staffing levels at Edinburgh and the roles and the costs of some of these operations and also next steps that are planned at Edinburgh, for instance, a data safe haven for the secure management of sensitive data. A final one to show you, which you may be interested in, is actually uh, one of the outputs from the LEARN project. Specifically, it's a survey. Is your institution ready for research data management? Um, take the LEARN survey and measure yourself. There are only 13 questions. You can take it any time you like. You can take it again in six months once you've uh, gone back to your universities and other institutions and advocated for research data management, and it might give you some idea of where perhaps you know investment needs to be made locally. Um, so um, if you follow that link sometime and take the research data survey, we'll, we'll see how ready, how ready you are. The final thing I wanted to mention is also it's a, it's a deliverable from loan. It's also in the toolkit. This is the executive briefing. Uh, it's there in six languages, I think. And uh, it is a very short piece of work that is intended to help you make the case for research data management investment and also to explain to your vice rector or whoever what the requirements are and what the responsibilities are likely to be and where they're likely to fall. So that's another smaller piece of uh, the learn output that may nonetheless uh, be very helpful to you. So I've talked a little there about what is in the learn toolkit and how we put it together. What I haven't talked about is the learn model policy and I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Paolo who's going to explain more about the uh, policy work that we did within the learn project. So thank you very much. Here is uh, Vienna speaking. My name is Paolo Budroni. I welcome you to this uh, presentation. So I'm supposed to talk about policies uh, concerning our project. And I divided my presentation into parts. First one is to understand, is in order to understand um, why these policies may be different from uh, the current uh, policies you maybe you, you find published in some website. Then I will enter into the topic by showing our policy, the result of this project. So our mission was first to understand what policies from uh, what policies are, then to create a model policy for research data management at research institutions, and then <coughs> to uh, produce a, um, an outlook. Uh, concerning for the further de development. Now, um, the three objectives, the data management policy, then the guidance, 
and uh, of course to start with some uh, initiatives in order to create some policy coordination and alignment there where policies already exist or there where uh, people or institutions start uh, with their work. We will now try to, under try to understand what are policies. What are the differences between policies and principles, for example, policies and taboos? So I will now start um, with uh, showing uh, some kind of uh, category, um, some kind of ontology. So we'll start talking about taboos, then start to talk about principles, and then I will go over to the uh, relations that are implicated, uh, the implicit, implic uh, the, the relations to the policy. And at the end, I will talk about the c c rules. Now, what is the taboo? Taboo is something which is generally is forbidden or disapproved. In society, you usually have just seven, eight taboos, like for example, don't kill. Now, concerning scientific data, a good taboo which we always follow is uh, scientific data should not be deleted or infrastructures should not be destroyed. Usually a taboo is a negative assertion and uh, as I mentioned uh, in our community as in society there are just a few taboos. A principle is something which is recognized as a fundamental truth or a proposition that serves as a foundation for a system of belief. For example, research data are to be preserved. And you see that we have a positive assertion. assertion. In the former slide we had do not delete. Now we say we have to preserve, as we have to preserve life, for example. Now a derivation for an academic institution or an academic service provider is uh, what we call the fair data principle. These are beliefs governing the organization's behavior. Now, traduced and translated into our world, we say research data are to be kept fair. It means findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. And concerning the infrastructures, research data infrastructures are to be kept accessible. Now, at the moment you uh, identify some taboos concerning the data and the infrastructures, then you can start to um, define the principle deriving from uh, these taboos. So we started with a few taboos and then we go over, go over to the principles and the principles are then more. Policies derive from a uh, uh, principle. So a policy is uh, a course or principle of action adopted or proposed by an organization or sometimes by individuals. For example, the institution, let's say University of Vienna, will preserve its research data infrastructure always accessible and free to its members according to the fair principles. So you see, we have a kind of development and this development is generated either from the bottom resulting from the action of individuals or from the top resulting from the action of an executive. This uh, uh, question is very important because uh, we always have to understand who decides about policies, who decides about policies at our institution, who decides policies at, in our repository, who decides about policies in our um, discipline. Is it something which is chosen by the bottom or is it something which is chosen by the top? This is uh, really interesting because uh, by answering this question, uh, you start to define roles, competencies, uh, and of course tasks. A further assumptions concern assumption concerning policy is a single. There is always um, we always have to have just one policy. It, the policy is a single entity. It should not be in competition with other policies. So it's not possible to live in a society where we say. So we have a republic, but on the same time we also have a monarchy. So you have to decide. This is the reason why usually you have just one policy, which is not in competition with other policies. The policies offer the frame for the generation of rules. And policies should be usually accepted after a while. 
the creators of the policy do not want to modify it. So um, policies are for everybody during a certain lapse of time. Now what happens is times, times are changing and policies often lag behind. And uh, th therefore we say policies are oriented to the past. And for this reason we have to rearrange, readapt the policies. Because they are always a reflection of existing conventions. But they are valid for long periods of time. And it is important to state when a policy expires. Now we go over to rules. So we started with a few taboos, uh, a dozens of principles, one policy, and, that, and now dozens of uh, rules and regulations. Rules are prescribing conducts of actions. They are generated by the founder of orders. Let's make an example. Rules are maybe sometimes not always clear. They often need interpretation according to the situation. Therefore, we also have guidelines explaining rules. We have commissions, we have committees explaining and interpreting rules. Maybe uh, rules are defined in one language, let's say in English, and then we translate it into another language. There is a committee offering interpretation or guidance to these rules. But rules are usually accepted and sometimes imposed as a procedure. It is allowed to modify rules by definition. It's very important. Uh, usually you do not change principles. So if we say we should preserve life, well, uh, we do not change this. But the rules concerning this principle, they may be uh, changed. And rules are only valid during a specific uh, period of time. The law is an expression of rules. Let's make an example for rules de deriving from uh, um, a policy which is derived from uh, a principle. Let's say, our university will maintain accessible our infrastructure each day from 9 to 12 a.m. and offer support only on Friday from 7 to 8 a.m. The research data that are publicly funded are to be kept free and accessible to all members of our university each Sunday from 9 to 12. So you see, this is an example on how the FAIR principle could be implemented at uh, one university. To maintain it uh, accessible during a lapse of time, to close it for the rest of the day, and uh, offer support just on one day, and uh, the research data well, they may be free and accessible, accessible to all members of our university each Sunday when nobody is working and uh, so you're allowed to do so. This is an example of uh, uh, rules. And you see by this example uh, that uh, um, we need a committee discussing these rules and to change it. Maybe a good example deriving from this one could be our university we we'll maintain accessible our infrastructure each day, 24 hours a day, and offer support each day, let's say from 8 to 17 hours in the afternoon. And the research data that are publicly funded are to be kept free and accessible, accessible always. So this is maybe a better rule. In this slide, we have a resume of uh, uh, what has been said till now. And uh, I skip now to the next uh, slide. Why do we need these differentiations? Because it's important to identify the different, the different semantic levels between the taboos, principles, uh, policies, rules, guidelines, good practices, and so on. Um, understanding the understanding of the semantic hierarchy is useful in order to produce appropriate guidelines. Our model policy was created um, after we have uh, started to identify uh, existing rules, first in Germany, in Austria, and Switzerland. Then uh, we took a look to other countries in continental Europe. 
Um, then uh, we arrived in, uh, in our survey in uh, Great Britain, we, where we found a lot of good policies, excellent policies. Then we took a look to other continents, and then we started to analyze them. The first production was uh, two grid documents for policies, in which we concentrated the formal elements and the, the, uh, of a policy and the content elements of policies. Then we continued by <coughs> creating a first model policies and uh, policy and guidance by continuously involving uh, our learned partner and discussing the insights at the five uh, workshops we held in London, in Vienna, in Helsinki, in South America, Santiago de Chile, and in Barcelona. Through this cooperation and through the mini workshops we organized with the United Commission for Economic Development in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, we, um, we could achieve to have a lot of uh, uh, findings and then we created the first model policy that uh, uh, went in the, through a peer review process and at the end we are proud now to present this policy, which is published uh, in the toolkit. Now, the, the policy is uh, uh, subdivided in uh, six uh, sections, um, and uh, we tried, according to our um, survey, to keep it simple. Simple, it, mean, it means to have a document of three pages, in, uh, including the definitions, and including the guidance, uh, which is a, a second document of three pages. Now, we subdivided it in six chapters, preamble, jurisdiction, intellectual property rights, handling of research data, responsibilities, rights and duties, and validity. Now, I start with the number six. It's, it, it's really interesting to know, as a reader, um, how this... Uh, um, policy has been created and when it expires. The second chapter I would like to focus on is the first one, the preamble. Uh, the preamble always shows um, and declares, um, according to the needs of, the, of each institution, why this institution has this, chosen this kind of policy. The second chapter, number two, jurisdiction, uh, it um, declares who are the members addressed or the units addressed by this policy and uh, uh, why they are addressed. The number three, the chapter intellectual property rights, defines within the institution what are the rights and of course the duties of the uh, involved stakeholders. And we have a lot of them. The number four, is uh, uh, giving advice on how to handle the research data according to the needs of uh, the institution. Of course, this is a model policy uh, that it should be tailored to the needs of a single institution, but in our chapter number four, we gave an advice on uh, the uh, possible uh, maximal number of uh, solutions. Number five is focusing on rights and duties of uh, um, the data producers and the, the research supporting uh, entities. In order to understand who is responsible, let's say, for quality, who is responsible for the maintaining of the, uh, of the services, who is responsible for skills and trainings, who should provide the needed resources, the resources that are needed to maintain the whole of the services. For example, Chapter 5.1 starts with researchers are responsible for, and 5.2 is the institution is responsible for. So let's skip through the different uh, uh, slides. You see, you have uh, at number one an example of a preamble. Jurisdiction is explained at number two. And uh, uh, number three, is where uh, we go deeper into the intellectual property rights issue. Um, handling the research data, which is uh, chapter four, is the next two slides, and uh, the chapters concerning responsibilities and uh, rights and duties 
are the following one. So I'm skipping through it because uh, the um, I'm supposed to just to talk about 10 minutes, and uh, you can uh, have a closer look to the um, to the policy itself in our toolkit. We published the Learn Toolkit in April of this year, and uh, um, I would like to spend some words or some uh, outlooks on what uh, we are doing as next. After the publication, we started to localize uh, the, the policies to the local needs of some uh, universities. Um, so we offer advice on how to transform it into another language and in, uh, in other realities. Um, so for example, uh, in Austria, we prepared it for the, um, for the group of art universities. And we will start by the end of May uh, with the medical uh, universities. We have four of them here in Austria. But we also uh, expanded our activities to Italy, um, to Venice, Padua, Milan, and Trucineca, which is the consortium of the Italian universities. And we are going to present uh, the Italian version of the policy according and tailored to the needs of the University of Milano. Uh, by the end of May, at the Open Science Day. Why do I um, stress this fact? Policies, as you say, saw, they are the result of an intellectual uh, work, starting with taboos, going to principles, going to policies, going to rules, and it should be, of course, uh, tailored to the needs of the uh, single university, single institution. And uh, please do not forget, policies, once they are implemented, they sh should also be measured. So there is also a further chapter, which are the key performance indicators that should be then, at the end of the process, uh, adapted and uh, uh, used for, the per for um, measuring the performance of the policies. Um, we invite you to go through our website and to uh, study the toolkit, where uh, there are a lot of case studies concerning the Latin, Latin American uh, region, and to the records of uh, our workshops, uh, I mentioned five of them before, and to the records concerning the mini workshops done uh, with ECLAC. We also published uh, an evaluation grid um, which is the result of two surveys we made within uh, t 12 months. And um, we developed 25 criteria, always according to what I said before. And this can be downloaded, and you can then compare uh, results. Please do not forget that the situation is rapidly changing. So um, universities and institutions are developing very fast at this moment in each country their own policies. This is our team here in Vienna, and uh, I thank you very much for the attention. Okay, thank you very much, Paolo, and thank you very much, uh, Martin, for these uh, very interesting uh, presentations. Um, I haven't seen any any questions in, in my chat box. So I hope that I, I didn't miss, it, miss anything. Um, so I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, um, and and if ah, I can see Shamin is uh, is typing a question, if uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Okay, Shamin, go ahead. Okay, we will wait for a few seconds until uh, Shamin is writing her comment. If you have any any other questions, please do write them in the chat box. Um, okay, okay, that, that's uh, that's very helpful. Thank you, Shamin. Um, so um, she uh, appreciate very much the Paulo's presentation with the breakdown of the uh, of, of policy. And uh, so I, I would like to uh, to raise my my question to to Paulo. Um, we, we know, and, and you've, you've explained that, you've talked about this, that you've invested a lot of time in, in outreach, uh, both in Austria, but also in Italy uh, and other countries. 
um, in in the context of the of the learn project, um, especially on on the level of the uh, the model policy. Could you give Paolo one one example of an institution that is currently implementing or has been implementing um, a research data management policy? And and could you uh, briefly say what the lessons learned uh, are there? Thank you. So yes, the mic is working. A good example could be, for example, the University of Edinburgh. You, we will find some findings about it in, uh, in the Learn Toolkit by some people working there. So Robin Rice was uh, was mentioned by Martin. Why is Edinburgh a good? Um, by the way, also Cambridge, for example. But why is Edinburgh really interesting? It seemed interesting to us because they are. Uh, they link their policy to other activities first, so to the Digital Curation Center, for example. Then uh, um, they reach to focus, they achieve to focus in uh, really um, in just one page, um, really interesting uh, um, questions. And they, they, they achieve to focus on each uh, thing that that is relevant for policies. So um, I would like to mention uh, what I mean. Um, so for example, um, research data um, and then educational data, which is the other side of the of the uh, of the medal. Then the um, the cultural heritage data. They are also mentioned there. Um, so you see, you can. Uh, um, you have a loop of a lot of data which are interesting uh, for the uh, research data issue and then the metadata. They describe uh, uh, very well who is uh, responsible for which item. So I would like to invite you to read uh, this uh, policy of Edinburgh. What I like to state is also <clears throat> talking about open data and fair data, it should also lead us to think about the issue of restricted data and closed data. Because open data are always accompanied by a tail of data which are restricted and closed. Thanks. A, a very small question, Paolo, for, for you, since we've been talking about policies. Um, uh, where do policies come from, from from the top or the bottom? What, what are the, uh, the lessons learned there? About yeah, thank you for the question. Um, during the, the workshops, uh, um, we always asked first uh, the audience, what do you think, um, uh, where do you think uh, does policy come from? And the first reaction usually is policies come from the top. But at the end of discussion, we all realized that policies come from the bottom. Uh, why do they come from the bottom? Because uh, policies should always mirror the, um, uh, what the researchers need. And they are creating, by their good practices, uh, rules and uh, habits, uh, behaviors. Uh, and the top, uh, the top level of university should understand what, uh, what is common sense? And in the second, uh, in, in the second uh, period of time, in the second phase, we can decide then at the top level to introduce a policy. But policies always come from the bottom. Okay. Uh, do people agree with this uh, statement, uh, Paolo's statement, that uh, policy come from, comes from the bottom? And if you if you do or you don't, please raise your hand. Any experiences? Okay, then um, just uh, put your, your questions or your comments or whether you agree or not in the chat and we will uh, come back on, on that uh, question after this. But uh, first I have a question for, uh, for Martin um, about incentives for uh, sharing uh, data 
uh, Martin. Um, what kind of incentives do you have at University College London, uh, Martin, uh, to make researchers share their data? Uh, and, and what does that say about how we can approach this uh, paradigm shift, which it is? I mean, it's about sharing data, which is a big cultural change for most uh, researchers and, and all stakeholders involved. Um, what, what have we? How, what have you learned there at University College uh, London about incentives, uh, Martin? Hi, thanks. Um, I could probably say a couple of things to that. Uh, in that, we are tackling the problems in a number of ways. The first one is through policy instruments and the usual um, governance of the university. So we have in all our policy statements and supporting um, website and whatever, all, all the RDM support that we do, we emphasize the, the importance of open data, uh, the, the, the general public good, the benefits to science. And in policy terms, we are basically telling people that your data needs to be open by default. Unless there's some good case for closing it, then we're encouraging open data. And this is the type of um, reaction that we're increasingly seeing from third party funders as well, who of course are major stakeholders in data creation and storage. So the EC's position is, is exactly that. Um, it's a, as open as possible. Um, make it open unless there's a very, very good reason why you can't. And that's being mandated now by, by um, the people who are paying for research projects. Separately though, at UCL, we are currently reviewing our academic promotions policy. And this is, um, this is a very good uh, place for incentivizing research behavior. So we have, at the moment, uh, got an understanding with the university that um, within the policy for academic promotions and, and reward, there uh, is, a, is a section for open behavior. So if you're, as a researcher, if you are compliant with the principles of open science and if you demonstrably um, support the principles of openness, then you, uh, well, I won't say you're more likely to get promoted, but that is an argument that you can officially and formally present as part of your case for a promotion. In other words, we're formalizing open science as part of the whole university incentive structure. So I think those are, well, there are a couple of things there, as I said. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you for, for that, uh, Martin. Um, you, you mentioned um, that uh, open science and being open is, in, um, is actually stimulated at university uh, by uh, getting a pay, a pay raise, to put it uh, <laughs> bluntly. Um, is something that is, is also that you, you've also seen in, in other institutions where you, you see that uh, promotion, people are actually promoted uh, based uh, on, on one of the criteria, which is openness? To be honest, I'm not aware that any other institution has done this, but I'm sure they have, um, particularly, you know, looking right across Europe. Um, and, and a lot of the talk coming out of the open science policy platform at European level exactly about incentives and the need for open science to have new metrics, new incentives, new reward systems. <clears throat> so I'd be surprised if we were being completely original. It's certainly something that's much talked about now. So if we are the first, I don't think we'll be the last. Okay, thank you very much, um, Martin. Um, any, any other questions? I didn't... Uh, I can see people confirming, uh, agreeing with Paolo's statement, basically, that um, those kind of important changes start at the bottom and, and don't have to, uh, to be lifted to, uh, to the top. 
Now, uh, one of the comments that Shamin uh, makes is that um, people at the, at the top do not necessarily understand um, this need for open science and this need for paradigm shift. I mean, um, is, is, is there uh, somebody who could uh, give an example, a success story of where um, this important change is started at the bottom and then uh, went up to the to the top so how how we uh, succeeded how we achieved in getting the message to the top of the uh, of the institution paulo yes uh, i think the whole open access uh movement is a good example on how the, the bottom, uh, the movement from the bottom uh, can achieve uh, good, uh, good results. So l l let's try to remember how it happened. In, in Budapest we had the, the Soros Foundation, the Open Society Foundation, that at the beginning of the century they decided to uh, declare with, a, with a, um, a publication how important it is to have an uh, open society. Open society, which means open access to everything which concerns the society. And uh, 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 this led us to the Open uh, um, Access Declaration of Budapest uh, a, a few months afterwards, and, or, or uh, years afterwards, uh, which was then taken in uh, Germany by the Max Planck Institute, and they started to, uh, to work on this uh, declaration until it, it led us to the uh, Berlin Declaration. So you see as a, a movement coming from the bottom um, generates, generates some movements at the top, just to have an example. Okay, thank you very much. Um, somebody who, who would like to add something to this discussion? Martin, something that you would like to add to this to, uh, to finish the, uh, the webinar as a conclusion? <laughs> well, not really. <laughs> All right. No, no, uh, I think, no. I mean, the, the, Okay, I, I think the fact that uh, uh, what we've been saying, that uh, I think we all realize that these are important changes. And I think um, with the toolkit, and with the model policy, and all the other outputs of the Learn Project, we have some um, very important tools now that each of us can uh, tailor, can customize according to the needs of uh, his or her own institution. And I think this is uh, really helpful uh, for most institutions because I think uh, many institutions uh, are aware. I mean, there's, uh, uh, especially at the bottom, there's no lack of, of awareness, but I think there is, uh, there is a lack of, of concrete tools uh, to actually implement this and to lift this to the level of, uh, of a policy. And I think uh, this is exactly what the, what the LEARN project tries to, uh, to achieve. And um, I think it is uh, uh, very important to know uh, from what Paolo and Martin said that by actually having this awareness at the bottom and having those tools uh, provided by the LEARN project, it is actually uh, possible. And so I think we can conclude with a very optimistic note saying that we can make this change uh, by um, stepping to our uh, policy makers and, um, and raising awareness on, on the top, uh, top level also about the, uh, uh, the importance of research data management on the institutional level. Um, okay, so with this... Uh, I think we can uh, we conclude this webinar. I hope you all enjoyed it. I definitely did, and I uh, look forward to being in touch with all of you in uh, the further uh, uh, follow up of of this uh, very important project. Thank you very much, and have a very nice day.